So Ahab called to all the Israelites and those prophets to Mount Carmel. Elijah approached the people and said, How long will you not decide between two choices? If the Lord is the true God, follow him. But if Baal is the true God, follow him. But the people said nothing. At the time for the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah went near the altar. Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He prayed, prove that you are the God of Israel. And I am your servant. Show these people that you commanded me to do all these things. Lord, answer my prayer so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you will change their minds. Then fire from the Lord came down and burned the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the ground around the altar. It also dried up the water in the ditch. When all the people saw this, they fell down to the ground crying, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Amen. First, okay. First, I want to thank uh, Danielle and Victor and Annika. Uh, there was another group who was supposed to lead the music, and they came down ill. And they put this together just this morning. So thank you so very much. Also, I just got a, a text message from Pastor Ben. He says the retreat is going very well so far, both spiritually and as a group. So, amen. Keep praying for them as they're on this trip. Um, and Robin, I was in Cabo last weekend, and on Sabbath, I was out watching whales uh, come up to the surface and do their thing, and it was awesome. So seeing the ocean reminded me of how awesome that was to be in God's nature on Sabbath. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Amen. I, uh, I have been accused of not preaching the full Adventist message at times. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. One of the reasons is, is that some have seen that I haven't talked about on a regular basis a very important Adventist teaching. I have taught that Adventist teaching not just now and then, but frequently, as I will explain in my message. What is it? It is the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Today, we're going to look at the first angel, and in two weeks, we'll look at the second and third. But I am going to take a much different approach than you have been used to. Because I believe there are some important insights. There are some basic, often overlooked principles that have been missed. We have gone to the very deep details immediately when we present the three angels' messages, and we have bypassed the basic principles that help us understand those details more completely. And so, before we look at the three angels' messages, I want to share with you a text of Scripture from Matthew 10, verse 16. But let me give you a context. Jesus was sending the 12 out, and he told them he wasn't sending them to the Samaritans. He was sending them to the lost sheep of Israel. And he was going to ask them to do something that would be unpopular. Yes, he was going to ask them to heal the sick, to, to cast out demons, but he was also going to ask them to teach a very much misunderstood concept. He was going to be giving them an unpopular message that they were to give to the people that they probably would not accept. And the message was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the reason what they were going to say was unpopular, even though they didn't understand it completely, was that because Jesus was there, the kingdom was there. 
And what Jesus wanted them to know is that the kingdom was not going to be an earthly kingdom, but it was going to be a, a spiritual kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And he wanted them to understand that, and the disciples didn't even understand it. But he also warned them. He gave them practical instructions of how they were to eat and where they get their food and where they were to stay. But he warned them that their message would not readily be accepted. In fact, it could easily be rejected, and they could be persecuted because of it. And so he ended his commission to them to go and give this unpopular message by saying, you need to be wise as serpents and, and uh, you need to be wise as serpents and humble as doves, as harmless as doves. Now, that, that sounds strange. I think most of us in looking at a serpent wouldn't think that a serpent is wise. They just stick out their tongues and slither. But, but it was a colloquial saying. It was a, a, an idiomatic expression. To be wise as serpents really meant something totally different. And I want to read to you a quote from uh, William Hendrickson's commentary on Matthew. What he says is, to be wise as a serpent means that there is a keenness recommended. It involves insight into the nature of one's surroundings, being aware of who's there and what they think and what they believe. He says there needed to be a circumsp circumspection I had to look that word up, so if you know what that word means, that's fine. I thought I knew what it means. I need to make sure. It means to be aware and to, to uh, deal with something wisely. A circumspection, a sanctified common sense, wisdom to do, and I would add say, the right thing at the right time, in the right place, and in the right manner, and a serious attempt always to discover the best means to achieve the highest goal. And so when Jesus said, be wise as serpents, he's saying, don't just go out and tell them the truth you have because you have the truth. He said, you need to do it wisely. You need to do it carefully. And then the idea of wise as serpents and, and harmless as dove, the harmless as dove means to do it with manners, and to do it gently, and to do it kindly. I believe that as we look at the three angels' message, we need to take what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16 to the disciples to our heart as well. In giving the three angels messages, we need to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And so I'm going to read the first angel's message because that's what we'll be dealing with this week. And in fact, I'm going to ask you to read it with me. It will be on the screen. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Please read with me having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Now I'm going to make an admission right now. We have looked at this, and when we've taught it, we've tried, first of all, to make people realize that it's not a literal angel that is messengers, that angel means messenger, and that human beings are sometimes referred to as messengers or angels in the New Testament. So it's not talking about an angel, literal angel flying, it's talking about messengers giving a message. And we talk about the fact that it's, an ever, it's a gospel to be preached to those who dwell on the earth, to everyone. It's a worldwide message. But then we tend to skip down to go past the first two imperatives that are there. We'll talk about that in a moment. And we go to the hour his judgment has come and to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the Sabbath. And we start talking about the details of the judgment and the details about Sabbath. And in doing so, we miss something very vitally important. In today's society, and those who were here a couple weeks ago, we recognize that fewer and fewer people have a biblical worldview. Fewer and fewer people have basic understanding of the basic concepts of what it means to follow God, of what the Bible is, of what it means to know God, what it means to know that God has a plan that he wants to come and talk to them and be with them. Very few in our society view the Bible as the authority for which to follow. And so, while when the 
Seventh-day Adventists were first being formed, and they began announcing the three angels' message. When they talked to people, most of them were Christians. They already knew about the first two imperatives. And so it was easy to skip to the third and the fourth. We can no longer do that today. We need to start out with something very basic. And so I'm going to suggest to you that there are basic principles that precede the particular details of the three angels' messages. What do I mean by basic principles? Well, if you're a sports follower, you know it's spring training in the baseball camps. And in spring training, they're supposed to go over the basics, and I'm not sure they do that much anymore. They just do what they did last year. But let's just take it down a level or two. Have you ever watched a t-ball game with little kids? If you haven't and you want a good laugh, go watch a t-ball game. Kids aren't sure what base to run to. They'll hit the ball and look over at mom and dad and wave. The ball only went two feet. They can hit the ball two feet and end up with a home run. They're learning the basics. You cannot tell a five or six year old, hey, let me teach you how to throw a curve. And they'll go, what? You can't tell them about how to, how to back up to, to go after a fly ball. They're not ready for that yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or let, let me, to make sure it's not just for those who are sports fans, let me use education. When I was growing up, we called it the, the ABCs, or reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now I'm not sure if that still applies, but that's another whole story. You can't ask a six-year-old to read William Shakespeare. You can't ask a six-year-old to read deep philosophy books. They need to start out with small sentences and then they'll move to chapter books and then they'll move to, to more in-depth thinking and finally when you get to high school and then college, you can take on some of those deeper books and understand with greater meaning. Or let me use one other, and this is not a political picture, okay? That happens to be when they were putting the foundation together for the Trump Tower. Okay? Architecturally, if you don't have a solid foundation for a tall high-rise building, the details of the high-rise building are going to collapse. And if we, we, in presenting the three angels' message, begin with the details, for those who aren't ready for it, the details will collapse and you will have lost the opportunity. Does that make sense at all? And so, we're going to have a different approach today. We're going to start with the basic principles of the three angels' message. And the first basic principle is that the everlasting gospel is the thread that defines the three angels. The three angels' messages do not define the gospel. I have heard Adventists make the three angels' messages a form of gospel. They are not. We are saved by what Jesus did and not by what we do. Period, period, period. I, so the question becomes, what is the gospel? One quote I found about the gospel is a, is a very limited approach to the gospel, I believe. It was on the website Bible.org in an article titled, What is the Gospel? And it says, in short, the gospel is the sum total of the saving truth as God has communicated it to lost humanity, as it is revealed in the person of, of uh, his son and in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. There are others who have maybe a little bit broader view in the next quote, and these quotes will be available afterwards. The next quote from Martin H. Manzer from the Dictionary of Bible Themes, the acceptable and comprehensive tool for topical studies, breathe, uh, says that the gospel rests upon the history of Jesus Christ, his birth, his obedient life, atoning death, physical resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven. I think there's a little bit more than that in the book Revelation of Jesus Christ by Ranko Stefanovich, which many of you have. You had him here speaking some time ago. He broadens it a bit, and I broaden it a bit, bit even more than he. So let's, going to look at the, let's look at the elements of the everlasting gospel. It includes the incarnation. The Son of God came in human flesh, and there's one text there. You can go to your uh, 
a topical Bible. You can go to your Bible concordance at the end of your Bible, and you can look up all kinds of texts about Jesus' birth and all, each of these final, uh, the final points. The gospel includes the, his perfect life and ministry. He had a sinless life. The gospel includes his death, his burial, his resurrection. It includes his ascension and intercession, according to Romans 8. It also includes his judgment against sin and the vindication of God's character, according to Romans 2.16. And it includes his second coming. Notice those are all things that I did. That, that deserves at least one chuckle, if not derision. Maybe even throwing things at me for that statement. It includes everything he did and everything he does. That's the good news of the gospel. And the three angels' message begin with the gospel, the everlasting gospel. It is the thread that runs through it. And while we, ref while we talk about that at the beginning of when we give the three angels, we leave it behind all too often. We need to read all three angels' messages with the lenses of the everlasting gospel reminding us that we are saved by who Jesus was and what Jesus did, period. The second basic principle is that Jesus must, Jesus must be the center of the message. While we have Jesus as very prominent in the first angel's message, we rarely have him prominent at all in the second and third angel. Rarely. I want you to notice what Revelation 1, 1 says. It says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, let me stop there. Some translations say from Jesus Christ. And some scholars love to do the debate. Is it a revelation from Jesus to us? Or is it a revelation of Jesus to us? And I say, yes. <laughs> it is both. It is a revelation of Jesus and from Jesus. It's a, the revelation of Jesus Christ. God gave it to him to show his servants the things that must happen soon. He sent this revelation through his angel to his servant John. And so the second basic principle is that Jesus must be the center of the, of the message. The third basic principle is that there is a basic principle in each message. Each message contains its own basic principle principles. And I want you to notice, we're going to look at the basic principles found in the first angel this morning. The basic principle of the first angel's message is there are four imperative commands in the first angel's message. Now, imperative command in Greek, in English, in almost any language is not something that is an option. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's a command to be followed. It's a command to be obeyed. And I want you to notice, I want to start out with and look at these four imperatives. Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. That's a basic principle. Second, the four imperatives are a synopsis of the first four commandments. Have you ever seen that before? The four imperatives are a synopsis of the first four commandments. Fear God, you're to have no other gods before me. Give glory to him, not bowing down and worshiping idols. And the reason people worshiped idols in the Old Testament and the New Testament times was they attributed to the idols, the idols' ability to give them the rain for their crops, to help their crops go, to give them food, to give them blessings. And when they prayed to idols, they were praying for them to give them the, what they needed for their daily lives. And in the second commandment, it says we're not to bow down to them. We're to bow down to God who alone is the one who can give us what we need. The third commandment is a bit trickier. Because in, in this first angel's message, it says the hour of his judgment has come. How is that thou shalt not take his name in vain? We usually attribute that commandment to swearing. I think, I think the that third commandment is maybe the most misunderstood of all the commandments. 
because we relegate it to simply don't use his name in vain. But notice the second part of that. The Lord will not hold them guiltless. In other words, he's not going to forgive those who take his name in vain. Well, that would mean if you've ever sworn using God's name, you are lost. No, don't misunderstand me. I think it is against using his name as a swear word. But in the Septuagint version of the, of the, New, of the Old Testament, it is translated this way. It says the Lord will not hold him guiltless, that we are not to take his name thoughtlessly. Not to take his name thoughtlessly. Remember that the issue in the judgment, it will be shown those who have truly said they are followers of Christ and who have allowed God to transform their lives to become more like him. It will show those, as Jesus talked about in Matthew 25, when he talked about the sep separation of the sheep and goats, because in that area, th the goats looked a lot like the sheep, and it was hard to tell them apart until they became mature. It, it will, the judgment will be about showing that those who have truly accepted the character of Christ, who've received his robe of righteousness, who have been covered and for, asked their sins to be forgiven and allow God to transform them. It will show those who've done that and those who've just said, I'm a Christian. Do you see the difference? And so I believe that the th third imperative, the hour of judgment has come, is really a synopsis of the third commandment. And of course, the fourth commandment is a reference to the Sabbath. Worship him who made the heaven, earth, and the seas heaven, the earth, and the seas. Now what's interesting is that he doesn't refer us to the rest, the other six commandments. But remember what Jesus taught. There are two basic commandments. Love for God and what? Love for man. And if you truly have love for God and if he is transforming you, the last six will fall in place. The last six will fall in place. And so when he, what we basically have here, and I want you to notice this, is that the first angel's message is calling people back to God. Calling people back to God. Adventists have often used the idea that the first angel, all three angels' messages, but especially the first, is the Elijah message, which is why I had that scripture read this morning. What was Elijah's message? If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And in today's society, you're not going to go out saying that phrase, but we can put it in another way. If God is God, follow him. What is God? It's the one you look to to sustain your life, to guide your life, to, to, to give you those basic necessities you need. What does man look to? for his self-worth. It's either what they do, their occupation, their status, I'm a mother, I'm a father, a grandfather, what they have, the material possessions, or their status in life, how people view them. Those have largely become modern man's idols that they worship. It is more important about what others say of me than what God thinks of me. It's more important of what I do than knowing that I am the Son of God. It's more important to know what I have and hold on to it versus trusting God to give me what I need. And so I would suggest to you, in fact, I believe this to be true, that the basic principle of the first angel is we are calling people back to God. And in our society, there is a society out there, there's a culture out there who no longer wants to have God in their life. Even among those who say they are Christian, they want God in their image. They don't want to be a human being in the image of God. There is a difference, a huge difference. We have usually traditionally given the first angel's message as a message to be given to those who are lost, and that is true. Is it possible that today 
we need to recognize that even church members, Adventist, Lutheran, Methodist, whatever, non-denominational, even church members need to hear a call back to worshiping God as God. Is it true that maybe even among us that you and I from time to time need to hear the call back to God to give him the place in our lives that he deserves? So how do we do that? How do we do that? Back to my disagreement. I believe I've given this message many, many times, frequently. I just haven't said, let me teach you about the first angel. I proclaim the, the good news of the gospel over and over again. And there's a myth in Adventism that says, unless you're teaching from Revelation 14, and unless you're mentioning the three angels, you're not teaching the message. If I'm teaching the gospel from the pulpit, if I'm teaching the gospel to youth, if I'm teaching the gospel in a Bible study, I am proclaiming the three angel, first angel's message. And if you're telling people what the gospel's about, so are you. It may not be the full message, but they may not be ready for the full message yet. That may come later. We are dealing with the basics so that when we get to the details, they might just be more readily ready to accept them. To understand them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to notice that the three angels' messages are a process. Beginning with the everlasting gospel, going to the first angel's message, the second angel's message builds on that, and the third angel's message builds on that. They are all inclusive. Once again, we can give the message of the three angels in a variety of ways. Sometimes by bits and pieces, sometimes in its entirety. But we need to be in tune with God, asking his spirit to know when to give the message, in what way to give the message, and how to give the message as we, as we look at the circumstances we are in, either in the total environment or of the persons we are talking with. I have given many Bible studies on ju the judgment. I have given many Bible studies on the Sabbath. I have given many Bible studies on what it means to fear God, not being afraid of him, but being reverent of him. And very honestly, the way we have dealt with the judgment and the Sabbath and the three angels' messages, we have appealed to people out of fear more than we have out of love. And the Bible says perfect love casts out what? Fear. There's something else you need to know. Decisions based on fear are often short-term. The commitments we make out of fear are short-term commitments. The commitments we make out of love last much longer. And sometimes we go, say the evangelist brought in people and baptized them and they left because they didn't understand the message. No, they left because they responded out of fear, not love. I believe that to be true. Why am I giving this message at this time in this church? Because I think we need to look at how we give the truths we believe in to other people in a different way at this time because we're talking to people who are different in their approach to life than they were when the, our Adventist founders first started giving the message. It does not deny the message we give it just recognizes that we're meeting people where they at, where they are at, and we're sharing the message that has changed and transformed our lives and has helped our lives to make sense and our spiritual walk with God to make sense. I want to end with a quote. It's from Ellen White from Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, from her article on repentance, the gift of God. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. Let me stop there. Justification by faith is the way we accept the gospel, the good news, okay? Third angels 
she's referring not just to the third angel's message, but she's making it an all-inclusive term for all three. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity, in truth, absolutely. The prophet declares, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power to be connected with the third angel's message. And conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. Brightness, glory, and power to be connected. That only happens when the, gospel, when the three angels' messages are proclaimed with the thread of the everlasting gospel and Jesus being the center. Period. Sometimes when we are giving the three angels' message, we give it like a bull in a china closet, thrashing around, destroying what's there. We need to be, as Jesus said, wise as serpents, harmless as dove, as we give the message of Jesus to the community around us that needs to hear the call to return to God. After the service, Elders will be up here to pray with anyone who chooses to pray. Please don't hesitate to come forward. You can ask them to pray for a need you have. You can ask them to pray for something you're rejoicing over. But don't hesitate to come forward to ask for prayer.